In this presentation, we will consider just a few items in the book of John, chapters 8 through 10. Again, I'd encourage you to read those. As you will know the whole storyline before you listen to this, it might be more helpful that way. So, with that in mind, let's start with chapter 8, verses 2 through 11. This is the famous story I think most of us know concerning the woman taken in adultery. The Pharisees bring this woman who was taken in adultery. Let's read part of this and consider some of the things that it teaches here. Verse 2, And early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, can, first of all, can you, can you conceive of that? How would they even know how to find a woman who was in the midst of committing adultery? May, may I suggest, I don't know this for sure, but is it possible that it's one of the scribes and the Pharisee who is the man that is committing adultery with the women? We don't know that for sure, but somehow they know how to find a woman who is committing adultery. And in the very act, they take her. That's very dark-hearted people. These are very sinful, evil, wicked men. And they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Again, how did they know where to find her? That's an interesting question to ponder and to consider. And what is their role in all of this? Showing the callous use of this woman by convening conniving religionists, the great scholar Frederick Farrar writes the following about these men. To, to subject her to the sufflurious horror of this odious publicity, to drag her fresh from the agony of detection into the sacred precinct of the temple, to subject this unveiled, un this, I'm sorry, disheveled, terror-stricken woman to the cold and sensual curiosity of a malignant mob, to make her with total disregard to her own sufferings the mere passive instrument of their hatred against Jesus, and to do all this not under the pressure of moral indignation, but in order to gratify a calculating malice showed on their part a cold, hard cynicism, a graceless, pitiless, barbarous brutality of heart and consciousness, which could not but prove in ever particular revolting and hateful to one, meaning Christ, who alone was infinitely tender because he alone was infinitely pure. I think they describe well how sick and demented and evil these scribes and Pharisees were to treat a daughter of God like this, just so that they could try to convict the Savior of something because of their hatred and jealousy towards him. What evil, evil men. Back to this verse now. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. What sayest thou? They want to know what he would do. Is he going to follow the law and stone her, or is he going to show mercy? See, they think they've got him either way. Look how hard-hearted he is. He won't show mercy. But if he doesn't stone her, they say, look, he won't even follow the law. Verse the law of Moses decreed death for adulterers, both of them, the man and the woman, and that the accuser's hand should cast the first stone. 
This was not such a case. The guilty man was absent. The aggrieved husband was lodging no charge, and no witness had been summoned that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word might be established. And so they're dragging this poor daughter of God, who is a human being, into this just to try to make the Savior look foolish. They're not even following the law of Moses. And here they're asking him about the law of Moses. Back to the verse. This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. One day it'll be interesting to know what he was writing on the ground. We have no idea. Maybe he was writing their sins on the ground. Who knows? <laughs> We're convicting them, but at this point we do not know. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone at her. Now, to get a better reading of this, listen to what Elder Bruce R. McConkie writes, quoting Brother McConkie. He spoke, and they knew he spoke, not of sins in general, but of the same sin, adultery, of which the woman was guilty. In other words, he was asked, saying, He among you that is not an adulterer, let him cast the first stone. What saith the law of Moses? The hands of the witnesses shall be first put upon him, shall first upon him be put him to death, and afterward the hands of all the people. That's what the law read in Deuteronomy 17.7. 7. Jesus had read their hearts and discerned their sins. There were none fit to accuse her according to the law. In other words, they all have committed adultery. When he says, he who's without sin, he's saying, he who's without that sin cast the first stone. And not one of them could do it because they were all adulterers, such evil and dark-hearted men. Back to the verse, verse 8. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own consciences, went out. They were all guilty of that sin. They couldn't cast the first stone. One by one, being beginning at the eldest, even to the last, and Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. And when Jesus lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are thine, those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Now he could have. He is the only one, the pure one, the one without sin that could condemn her. But he says, I do not condemn thee. Go and sin no more. What a tender-hearted, compassionate gentleman this man we call our Savior, Jesus the Christ, is. Why wouldn't we want to worship such a wonderful being and how he treats this daughter of God with such dignity and respect? Maybe that should be a lesson to us on how we treat all people, regardless of their sins, regardless of their past, regardless of what they've done. Christ is showing us how we should treat people. In fact, Elder Marvin J. Ashton of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles and General Conference shares the following, which I believe goes along with all of this. During an informal fireside, address held with a group of adult Latter-day Saints, the leader directing the discussion invited participants participation by asking the question, how can you tell if someone is converted to Jesus Christ? For 45 minutes, those in attendance made numerous suggestions in response to this question. 
and the leader carefully wrote down each answer on a large blackboard. All of the comments were thoughtful and appropriate, but after a time, this great teacher erased everything he had written. Then acknowledging that all the comments had been worthwhile and appreciated, he taught a vital principle. The best and most clear indicator that we are progressing spiritually and coming unto Christ is the way we treat other people. Did, did you catch that? Let, let, let me read that one more time. This certainly follows the story of Christ and the Pharisees and the woman taking adultery. Again, he said, the best and most clear indicator that we are progressing spiritually and coming unto Christ is the way we treat other people. Continuing Elder Ashton, would you consider this idea for a moment that the way we treat the members of our family, our friends, those with whom we work each day is as important as some of the most noticeable gospel principles we sometimes emphasize? Imagine what could happen in today's world in our own wards or families or priesthood quorums and auxiliaries if each of us would vow to cherish, watch over, and comfort one another. Imagine the possibilities. One young woman serving in a stake relief society president and at the time also laboring under the pressure of an especially challenging project lost her temper one morning during a presidency meeting. The cause of her unhappiness had little to do with the question at hand and was related more to the fact that at the time she was laboring under intense home pressure on a major task and was feeling frustrated and frazzled. Afterwards, she was embarrassed at her behavior and immediately called to apologize for her outburst. Her friends in the presidency were generous and told her not to think another thing about it. Still, she wondered if they might think less of her, how that they'd seen her at, le at less than her best. But that evening, the doorbell rang around dinner time, and there stood the other members of the presidency with dinner in hand. We knew when you lost your cool this morning that you must just be worn out. We thought a little supper might help. We want you to know we love you. The young woman was amazed. In spite of her outburst that morning, her friends were there to offer support rather than criticism. Rather than seize the opportunity to bash her, they were filled with the spirit of charity. Continuing Elder Ashton, be one who nurtures and who builds. Be one who has an understanding and forgiving heart, who looks for the best in people. Leave people better than you found them. Be fair with your competitors, whether in business, athletics, or elsewhere. Don't get drawn into some of the parlance of our day and try to win by intimidation or by undermining someone's character. Lend a hand to those who are frightened, lonely, or burdened. If we could look into each other's hearts and understand the unique challenges each of us faces, I think we would treat each other more gently with more love, patience, tolerance, and care. If the adversary can influence us to pick on each other, to find fault, bash and undermine, to judge or humiliate or taunt, half his battle is won. Why? Because though this sort of conduct may not equate with succumbing to grievous sin, it nevertheless neutralizes us spiritually. The Spirit of the Lord cannot dwell where there is bickering, judging, contention, or any kind of bashing. Boy, we need to better understand that in our families, don't we? We can lose the spirit so quickly in our families just by the way we talk and treat each other. Back to Elder Ashton. 
Once again, may I, am, may I emphasize the principle that when we truly become converted to Jesus Christ, committed to him, an interesting thing happens. Our attention turns to the welfare of our fellow man, and the way we treat others becomes increasingly filled with patience, kindness, a gentle acceptance, and a desire to play a positive role in their lives. This is the beginning of true conversion. And so I suggest to you and to me that we consider how is our conversion and that will all depend on how are we treating other people. Let's turn to John chapter 9, verses 1 through 3, the story of the man born blind. Verse 1, And Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned, nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him, so that I can show forth my power and my works, so that I can show you that I am the Christ, and that I have power to help you. That's why he was born blind. May I suggest, brothers and sisters, that that's why we have some of the weaknesses that we have and that he does not take them all away that maybe he's trying to manifest his power in our lives by us humbling our hearts and seeking his help if he took everything away then what would we go to him for see that could be a problem I just want to share briefly and not in much detail because of its personalness that I live a life with mental illness that it sometimes can be quite severe and quite debilitating and for years have wished that God would just take it away. I know that he can. That I have seen. That I have proven from the scriptures. He has the ability. The question is not can he. But I have been told in certain ways that no, he is not going to. And because he is not, I have had to rely upon him to bear my burdens with dignity, to bear them the best I know how and that his power has been manifested in my life as he has helped me through these times of mental illness that I struggle with. And because of that, my witness of him is stronger. My testimony is stronger. I know that he has power to help us, and he will help us through. Brothers and sisters, the reality is God will not move every mountain out of our way Sometimes he will ask us to climb the mountain. And then that's when we need to rely upon him. I think this is what we're trying to get at in Ether chapter 12, verse 27, probably one of the most quoted scriptures in all of the church. And if men come unto me, I will show unto them their weakness. Notice that that's singular, not plural. I will show them their weakness. In other words, I'll show that you are fallen. You are the natural man. You do have a fallen nature, a weakness. I give unto men weakness, a fallen nature, that they may be humble if we so choose. Back to the quote, And my grace is sufficient for all men that humble themselves before me. For if they humble themselves before me, and have faith in me, then will I make weak things become strong unto them. I think he lets us suffer through certain things. One, so that he can manifest his power in our lives, if we'll turn to him, if we will let him. And two, to help humble us, so that we will turn to him and rely upon him, that we cannot do this alone. There are many things in our lives we just need his help with. And he is just waiting for us to humble our hearts and to ask 
for that help. And I know he will give it, not in the way usually that we are expecting, but he will give it in a way that will be the best for us. That I know to be true. Let's take a look at John chapter 10, a famous chapter I think we're all familiar with about the good shepherd, how Christ is the good shepherd and the sheep know his voice. I would just like to share with you a story by Elder John R. Lassiter of the Quorum of Seventy and General Conference where he shares the difference between what a shepherd is versus a sheep herder. Listen to the experience he had in the Middle East concerning a shepherd and the tenderness they have over their flock. Some years ago, it was my privilege to visit the country of Monaco as part of an official United States government delegation. As part of that visit, we were invited to travel some distance into the desert to visit some ruins. Five large black limousines moved across the beautiful Moroccan countryside at considerable speed. I was riding in the third limousine, which had lagged some distance behind the second. As we topped the brow of the hill, we noticed that the limousine in front of us had pulled off to the side of the road. As we drew near, I sensed that an accident had occurred and suggested to my driver that we stop. The scene before us has remained with me for these many years. An old shepherd in the long flowing robes of the Savior's day was standing near the limousine in conversation with the driver. Nearby I noticed a small flock of sheep numbering not more than twenty, fifteen, or twenty. An accident had occurred. The king's vehicle had struck and injured one of the sheep belonging to the old shepherd. The driver of the vehicle was explaining to him the law of the land. Because the king's vehicle had injured one of the sheep belonging to the old shepherd, he was now entitled to one hundred times its value at maturity. However, under the same law, the injured sheep must be slain and the meat divided among the people. My interpreter hastily added, but the old shepherd will not accept the money. They never do. Startled, I asked him why, and he added, because of the love he has for each of his sheep. It was then that I noticed the old shepherd reached down, lifted the injured lamb into his arms, and placed it in a large pouch on the front of his robe. He kept stroking its head, repeating the same word over and over and over again. When I asked the meaning of the word, I was informed, Oh, he is calling it by name. All of his sheep have a name, for he is their shepherd. And the good shepherd knows each one of their sheep by their name. It was as my driver predicted. The money was refused, and the old shepherd, with his small flock of sheep, with the injured one tucked safely in the pouch on his robe, disappeared into the beautiful desert of Morocco. As we continued our journey towards the ruins, my interpreter shared with me more of the traditions and practices of the shepherds of the land. Each evening at sundown, for example, the shepherds bring their small flocks of sheep to a common enclosure where they are secure against the wolves that roam the deserts of Morocco. A single shepherd then is employed to guard the gate until morning. Then the shepherds come to the enclosure, one by one, enter therein, and call forth their sheep by name. The sheep will not hearken unto the voice of a stranger, but will leave the enclosure only in the care of their true shepherd, confident and secure, because the shepherd knows their names, and they know his voice. What a great example of what a shepherd is versus just a sheep herder who herds sheep and doesn't have that kind of concern over his flock. What a great story. 
in comparison to Christ as our shepherd. Aren't you glad he's a shepherd and not a sheep herder? His care and his love that he has for each one of us, and he knows each one of us by name. Hopefully we know his voice, and we listen, and we will hearken as he calls us to him. Well, in John chapter 10, verses 17 through interesting, there are two very important verses that is the crux of all of Christianity. And I put on the slide here, who kills the Savior with a question mark. Listen to what the Savior says in John 10, 17 through 18. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. Brothers and sisters, in the overall scheme of things, no one really kills the Savior. Oh, they offer him up, and they yell crucify, and they take him away, and they will drive spikes in his hands, and in his feet, and in his wrists. But no one takes his life from him. That's the whole point. The Savior willingly offers himself as a sacrifice for our sins, for our weaknesses, for our afflictions. He offers up. He has power to lay down his life. And he had power to take it again. At any time during this whole process, he could have stopped all of it and said, enough is enough. I'm not doing this. I have done nothing wrong. But no, he willingly gives up his life for us. The least we could do, brothers and sisters, is willingly give our lives for him in his church and in his service. May we willingly give of ourselves as he willingly gave up himself for us. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the presentation, hit the like button. And consider subscribing to my channel.